Please be seated. Good morning and happy Easter. In speaking of the great central truths of the faith, we frequently use the word mystery. Mystery. We speak, for example, of the mystery of the Blessed Trinity, three persons in one God. We speak of the mystery of the Incarnation, the Word made flesh. We speak of the mystery of the cross, and so forth. We use this term, mystery, because it expresses the truth that much of the nature and the activity of God are incomprehensible to us mere mortals. There are profound truths in God that we believe and we profess by faith, but that we don't fully comprehend, nor, by the way, are we supposed to, this side of eternity. After all, God told us this in Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. St. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 that we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. And in, first, uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, he says this, that God has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. The Trinity is a mystery because the math doesn't add up, right? The Incarnation is a mystery because there's never been another person in all of history, in the entire history of mankind, never another person who was born of a virgin and who had two distinct natures, one human and one divine. The cross is a mystery on many levels, not the least of which is the simple question of why God chose it, that is, the horrific death of his son, as the method and means by which he redeemed the world from sin and death and Satan. And this morning, on this Easter Sunday morning, amidst all of this beauty and rejoicing, we are confronted yet again with a mystery the mystery of Christ's resurrection, the mystery of life over death, and of our life out of his death. And like the mystery of the cross, the mystery of the resurrection is incomprehensible on many levels. Of course, we know that the author of life itself, the one who called all of creation into being simply by the word of his mouth, has power over life and death. We read these words of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I hold the keys of death and of Hades. But the mystery remains. In last evening's gospel passage on the resurrection, the vigil masses account from St. Matthew, we read this. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. There you will see him. You want to know one of the things that strikes me personally as part of the mystery in this declaration by the angel in Jesus' tombs? One of the things that brings it home yet again that God's thoughts are not my thoughts nor are my ways his ways. Here it is. You may have missed it. The angel said, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Galilee. This is actually a fulfillment of one of the things that Jesus had told the disciples just a few days earlier at the Last Supper 
when he said to them, After I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Now, why do I say that this part of the resurrection is part of its mystery? In one sense, it shouldn't be, because it is thoroughly consistent with the way Jesus' entire life on earth unfolded, that is, in obscurity. He was born in a humble, borrowed stable in the tiny backwater village known as Bethlehem, with only his mother, his foster father, and a handful of shepherds on hand. He grew up in the equally obscure village of Nazareth, making his early living as a simple carpenter. One of his future apostles even once quipped, can anything good come out of Nazareth? The only truly significant city that Jesus ever set foot in was Jerusalem. And then, mostly to comply with the Levitical law that required devout Jews to go to Jerusalem for the major feasts. Oh, and then, of course, his last visit there was to go there and die. Crucified like some common criminal, outside the walls, and then buried in a borrowed tomb. In other words, the most momentous, earth-shattering series of events in the history of the world took place in a time and place that ensured that they would be shrouded in obscurity. It's not as I would have done it, maybe not as you would have done it. If it had been up to me, it wouldn't have been first century Israel, but more like 20th or 21st century America, or at least Europe, with benefit of cable news and internet coverage for all the world to see and hear and blog about. Oh wait, I forgot. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Not to be crass about it, but surely after 33 years of obscurity and a painful, ignominious death, at least the resurrection could have been more widely witnessed and better publicized, and Jesus could have picked a more visible and more sophisticated place than Galilee to meet his disciples. If I had been Jesus, the very first place I would have gone after rising from the dead would have been Pontius Pilate's front door. <laughs> or better still, I would have waited until late that night and waken him up in his bedroom. <laughs> Caiaphas, too, and the rest of the Sanhedrin. Or maybe just a big, dramatic appearance in the temple. But Jesus does none of that. The fanfare, the notice of important people have never moved him, ever. In fact, just days before, at his mock trial, he had already told Pilate, the most important man in earthly terms he would ever encounter, you have no, would have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. So-called important people, places, and things have never, ever moved Jesus, and they're not going to start now, now that the mission is accomplished, now that sin and death and Satan have been defeated. No. He goes not to the seat of temporal power. He goes not to the epicenter of Jewish religious life. He goes to Galilee. Why? Ask yourself why. Here's the answer. Because he is most concerned with his disciples. And Galilee is their home. That is where they are comfortable, secure, and at peace. And peace is exactly what Jesus wants to impart to them. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before them into Galilee. There you will see him. Galilee, not a center of religious or political or societal power. It is simply the disciples' home and the scene of so many of their past stumbling failures as they struggle to respond in their own often inept way to Jesus' call to discipleship. 
So Jesus returns to where it all began. It began in Galilee. It ended in Jerusalem, but it began anew in Galilee. Are you aware that 80% of the gospel record takes place in Galilee? There the disciples had first met Jesus. There he first called them to follow him. There they attempted most of the hard work of discipleship. There Jesus worked the vast majority of his miracles, signs, and wonders. In Jerusalem, the disciples had denied and deserted him. Now in Galilee, they will meet him again and get a second chance at being the disciples he called them to be because Jesus is risen. He is alive and he's coming to where we live. And so my question to you on this Easter Sunday morning is this. Where and what is your Galilee? While the resurrection happened once at a point in history at a specific time and a specific place, the resurrected one comes out to meet us today in our Galilees, in our world, our element, our turf, where we live. In Galilee, the ineptness and unfaithfulness of the disciples, even the abject denial by Peter, none of it was the end of the story. A fresh start can be made because Jesus is risen and nothing will ever be the same again. And he's coming to Galilee. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to linger at the tomb. He's not there. He's risen and he's coming to us. The resurrection accounts record Jesus meeting his own in the most ordinary of places and circumstances, at breakfast on the beach, along the roadside, by the seashore where they're cleaning their fishing nets, in a room where they're hunkered down. Most of us live in places like Galilee, where we're living, working, loving and raising our families dealing with life's joys and sorrows, challenges and struggles, cleaning the house, mowing the lawn, bathing the kids, buying groceries, trying to balance the household budget. Brothers and sisters, it's there that Jesus wants to meet us. We think of church as the place where we meet the Lord, and of course there's much truth in that. Or we think of those occasional mountaintop experiences at a retreat, for example. True enough for both. We can and do meet him in those settings. Here in church, of course, most importantly, in the Eucharist. But we're only here in church for a little over an hour on Sunday morning. We may go on a retreat at most once a year for a few days or maybe a week. Jesus said, however, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. He directed that promise to the church in general and to each and every one of us specifically. He will never leave nor forsake you. In the stress of your workplace or of school, in the sometimes quiet, sometimes hectic environment of your home, in the humdrum of day-to-day -day life, Jesus wants to meet you. And more than simply meet you, he wants to remain with you. He wants to fill your life and to transform it forever. And so in conclusion, Jesus went to Galilee, to the place where the disciples lived, in order to begin to impart to those disciples all the merits, all the graces which he had just won by his death and resurrection. And he wants to do the same for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.